Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We're glad to have you with us tonight. We've been working our way through the book of Exodus over a number of months now, and tonight we are ready for Exodus chapter 38. And so as always, we want to encourage you to find a copy of the Bible on your own if you can. We'll have the text on the screen, but there's certainly a value to seeing it on your own, in your own lap, or on your own device. So uh, Exodus chapter 38 is where we'll be in just a few moments. As always, if you have any questions, any comments about tonight's class, if you have something that we need to be praying about as a congregation, we want to invite you to get in touch. You can send a message to me at info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also call or send a text to 608-224-0274. But as I said tonight, we are back to the book of Exodus. So we know from the book here that we've been looking at now for a number of months, God's people are now free from their slavery in Egypt. And they are almost ready to leave Mount Sinai, but before they do, they are building the tabernacle. And that's where we are tonight. At this point, they have built the tent itself. Last week, they will build the uh, they built the furniture inside the tabernacle. Tonight, they basically build the rest of it. So once again, tonight's study will most likely be a little bit shorter than most. Uh, I hate to say that any of the Bible is not very practical, but I think if it applies to anything, it'd be a chapter like this one tonight. Uh, just the details of the tabernacle being built, and certainly the tabernacle was a shadow uh, foreshadowing the church and so on that was to come in the future. But uh, we're just looking at the history of it here and making sure they get this thing built. So Exodus chapter 38, and the first paragraph tonight is verses 1 through 8. Exodus chapter 38, verses 1 through 8. Then he made the altar of burnt offering of acacia wood five cubits long and five cubits wide square and three cubits high. He made its horns on its four corners, its horns being of one piece with it, and he overlaid it with bronze. He made all the utensils of the altar, the pails and the shovels and the basins, the flesh hooks and the fire pans. He made all its utensils of bronze. He made for the altar a grating of bronze network beneath, under its ledge, reaching halfway up. He cast four rings on the four ends of the bronze grating as holders for the poles. He made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with bronze. He inserted the poles into the rings on the sides of the altar with which to carry it. He made it hollow with planks. Moreover, he made the laver of bronze with its base of bronze from the mirrors of the serving women who served at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Well, we're now outside the tabernacle itself as he makes the altar. And the he is not defined for us here in chapter 38. I'm, I think it's pretty safe to assume uh, that this is almost certainly a reference to Bezalel, referred to back in chapter 37. Remember, there were no chapter or verse divisions in the original manuscripts. And I'm also assuming that Bezalel most likely has some help. So I don't think he's out there working completely alone on this. Uh, most likely he has a team of workmen working alongside him on this. And he may be something of uh, like an overseer. He gets the job done, but he has help to do it. So he makes the altar. And notice that he makes it just as God has instructed. We looked at the instructions several weeks ago. It's basically a large box. And it's covered in bronze with horns on its corners for hanging the sacrifices. It has some bronze grating in it, uh, just like we might have in a Weber grill. You need to kind of have some airflow under a fire. This is what allows that, a place for the meat to sit on top. And then they also have the utensils. And notice this altar, like the other furniture, is also constructed with a system of rings and poles. And that, of course, was designed to allow this furniture to be carried. The tabernacle and everything associated with it was to be very portable. They had to uh, deploy it and then have it there for a few days or weeks or months and then pack it all up and get on the road again. Well, in verse 8, they make the laver of bronze, which is basically a large dish of water. And that was intended for giving the priest a place to wash before they were to serve in the tabernacle. And I will admit that I do not really know what's going on in the second half of verse 8. Uh, the commentaries weren't really standing in line to give an explanation of this, but it appears that they make the bronze labor uh, out of the mirrors of the serving women who served at the doorway of the tent of meeting. 
So, you know, one meaning possibly here is that before the tabernacle, there were women who served in the entryway of the tent of meeting, that the tent of meeting was separate from the tabernacle. I know we had this discussion a, a few weeks ago. I'm kind of assuming it was the same building, and, I, you know, I'd have to go back and review our discussion from then, but it's kind of a little bit complicated here, a little bit, uh, not, not really sure what he's referring to. Uh, but they apparently used bronze mirrors and that these bronze mirrors were used by the women uh, who were serving in the tent of meeting. And so, you know, beyond that, that's all we know. And I'm guessing bronze can be polished to the point you could see a reflection in it. So that's the obvious meaning here. Um, years ago, whenever I would go down to the state fair in Illinois as a 4-H'er, um, if you had some winning project, I think I had woodworking, maybe photography one year, a few things were going on, but you, you would represent your county at the state fair. So you took a bus down there with the other people who won, and we would stay in these buildings that were uh, dormitories that were used for prisoners. And I don't know what they did with the prisoners during the state fair, uh, but uh, we had those prison dormitories for the week or so that we were there. And as I remember, these buildings were, in my view at that time, ancient. So I don't know if they went back to the 20s or 30s, but uh, they had two or three stories, uh, kind of scary looking, and they had several very large rooms full of these steel bunk beds. And then in the restrooms, they had rows of toilets with these dividers that were only maybe two or two and a half, three feet tall. So that's one thing I remember from those trips down there. That was kind of weird. But then over the sinks, they had these stainless steel mirrors, as I would kind of call them, that were bolted to the wall. And um, they weren't glass. I'm assuming, you know, since glass could be broken and used as a weapon, they wouldn't want that kind of thing in a prison dormitory. But the steel... Uh, was polished so that you could just barely see your reflection. You could just uh, just barely make yourself out there. So I think that's what comes to my mind when I read this verse that seems to describe these bronze uh, mirrors. So bronze that was polished so that it could be used as a mirror. Uh, and, and those are now incorporated into the bronze labor. So I don't know if these ladies donated those or exactly what's going on here, but that, that's what they used to build the bronze labor. So I thought that was a little bit interesting. All right, well, let's continue tonight with Exodus 38, verses 9 through 20. And it kind of all goes together, one big chunk here. Exodus 38, verses 9 through 20. Then he made the court. For the south side, the hangings of the court were of fine twisted linen, 100 cubits. There are 20 pillars and there are 20 sockets made of bronze. The hooks of the pillars and their bands were of silver. For the north side there were 100 cubits, their 20 pillars and their 20 sockets were of bronze, the hooks of the pillars and their bands were of silver. For the west side there were hangings of 50 cubits with their 10 pillars and their 10 sockets, the hooks of the pillars and their bands were of silver. For the east side 50 cubits, the hangings for the one side of the gate were 15 cubits with their 3 pillars and their 3 sockets, and so for the other side. On both sides of the gate of the court were hangings of fifteen cubits, with their three pillars and their three sockets. All the hangings of the court all around were of fine twisted linen. The sockets for the pillars were of bronze, the hooks of the pillars and their bands of silver, and the overlaying of their tops of silver. And all the pillars of the court were furnished with silver bands. The screen of the gate of the court was the work of the weaver, of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen. And the length was 20 cubits, and the height was 5 cubits, corresponding to the hangings of the court. Their four pillars and their four sockets were of bronze, their hooks were of silver, and the overlaying of their tops and their bands were of silver. All the pegs of the tabernacle and of the court all around were of bronze. Well, just continuing on with the exterior of the tabernacle, we've done the altar, we've done the labor, which are out there in the courtyard. We now move to the hangings. Uh, tapestries, we might say. These were made of uh, fine twisted linen. So these are the curtains, uh, the dividers, or the fences, we might say, hanging all around the courtyard, giving worshipers privacy. And the hangings are supported by a series of pillars and sockets, and these are made of bronze and silver. We've also got a gate, uh, so like a screen made out of twisted linen as well. And they just make all of this as God has instructed. So I think that's what we need to get out of this, that they're following the Lord's instructions here. So let's continue then with Exodus 38, verses 21 through 23. Exodus 38, 21 through 23. This is the number of the things for the tabernacle, the tabernacle of the testimony, as they were numbered according to the command of Moses for the service of the Levites. 
by the hand of Ithamar, the son of Aaron, the priest. Now Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, made all that the Lord had commanded Moses. With him was Oholiab, the son of Ashamach, of the tribe of Dan, an engraver and a skillful workman, and a weaver in blue and in purple and in scarlet material and fine linen. In verse 21, we don't have the number, I don't think, that he's really talking about here, but Moses tells us, as I understand it, that they number everything and that this numbering is in some way tied to the service of the Levites. So I'm guessing this is, a, it'd be a logistical challenge, wouldn't it? To set up this building, take it down, get it packed up, get it sent off to the next location, and so on over and over again while traveling. But they have some kind of a system here, uh, seems to be the point of sharing this. And notice in verse 22, we find out that everything is in fact made by uh, Bezalel, as I referred to earlier, bringing his name over from chapter 37. But we find here, Again, he is assisted by a Aholiab and Ashamach, an engraver, a skillful workman, and a weaver. So all kinds of work going on here. Different fields come together, different specialties, and Moses had certainly delegated the construction of the tabernacle. Uh, Moses didn't feel like he had to do this all himself, so uh, he shared the labor here, and these other men get it done. And uh, Moses is uh, there to make sure maybe that it's done according to God's pattern. So let's conclude tonight with Exodus 38, verses 24 through 31, the rest of this chapter. Exodus 38, verses 24 through 31. All the gold that was used for the work, in all the work of the sanctuary, even the gold of the wave offering, was 29 talents and 730 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. The silver of those of the congregation who were numbered was 100 talents, and 1,775 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. 26 a beka a head, that is, half a shekel, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. For each one who passed over to those who were numbered from 20 years old and upward, for 603,550 men. The hundred talents of silver were for casting the sockets of the sanctuary and the sockets of the veil, 100 sockets for the hundred talents, a talent for a socket. Of the 1,775 shekels, he made hooks for the pillars and overlaid their tops and made bands for them. The bronze of the wave offering was 70 talents and 2,400 shekels. With it, he made the sockets to the doorway of the tent of meeting and the bronze altar and its bronze grating and all the utensils of the altar and the sockets of the court all around and the sockets of the gate of the court and all the pegs of the tabernacle and all the pegs of the court all around. It's kind of hard in that paragraph to read it, not knowing if I was supposed to read the number uh, uh, like it was a significant number or if it was a verse number. So you got all kinds of uh, numbers thrown in here. Uh, but basically in this paragraph, this last one here, we've got a summary of how much silver and gold they used in the construction of the tabernacle. So it's kind of an interesting figure to consider. And we start with the gold described as weighing 29 talents. So here we go, you know, we're dealing with some ancient measurements, but uh, a talent, as best we can tell, uh, was somewhere around 75 to 100 pounds, but even that's not sure, and it varies from old to the new and the usage of that word, so it's kind of complicated and confusing. Uh, ultimately, I'm thankful. I don't think my salvation depends on knowing exactly how much gold went into the tabernacle. Uh, but the way I'm looking at it at this point is somewhere between maybe two to three thousand pounds of gold. Um, that's a lot of gold. Um, so a shekel was much lighter with maybe three thousand shekels in a talent of gold. Uh, but again, we're dealing with measurements from close to 3,500 years ago. So it's kind of hard to be insistent on the conversion of those weights into something that we might understand today. I hope you understand uh, that it's kind of difficult to nail that down, but I think we do understand, backing away from this, getting the big picture, that this is a lot of gold and silver. I think that's very safe to say. We've got thousands of pounds of gold and silver here. And then in verse 26, we have what might be one of the earliest references to how many people that we're dealing with here. And it's not specified. I think we can assume, uh, based on what comes later in numbers, that the number of men is 603,550 who were 20 years old and older. And so if you want to know how many were in the group as a whole, you know, I would consider taking that 603,000 and doubling it to account for the women. If you say roughly the same number of men and women in a group that size between or, uh, 20 years old and older, 
And then you would add a pretty good chunk to account for the children. They would have had a lot of kids between birth and up to 20 years old. And so that's why we kind of talk about this group in our studies of this book as being roughly two to three million people. It was a huge group. And I haven't checked lately. I, I believe the population of the city of Chicago, last time I remember checking, was around 2.8 million in the city itself. You know, it gets up to 8 million, maybe if you include the suburbs or whatever. But whenever I think about this group of 2 to 3 million coming out of Egypt, crossing over the Red Sea, gathering around Mount Sinai, in my mind, having grown up around Chicago, I think of the city of Chicago. So it's roughly a group that size. So a huge group of people. And uh, this is one of the first times that we have that actual number given for us here. Well, this brings us to the end of Exodus 38. Again, hopefully next week we'll keep on pushing through to Exodus 39. I think there are only 40 chapters. And I am still debating in my mind where to go next. Uh, I've considered maybe hitting some highlights from Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, not going through all the gruesome details, but, you know, little chunks here and there. Uh, maybe over in the New Testament, I'm not sure. Some of the minor prophets are, are feeling kind of interesting to me right now. If you have a strong opinion on that, let me know. And uh, certainly take that uh, under advisement. So uh, next week, chapter 39, they're going to make the garments for the priests and kind of wrap up the construction of the tabernacle before we close out the book the week after that. But thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for being with us. And again, if you have any questions, any comments about tonight's class, if there's some way we can help, something we can do to encourage you, if there's something we need to be praying about, let us know. Uh, send me an email, info at fourlakeschurch.org. You could also call or send a text to 608-224-0274, but we'd love to hear from you. Uh, so let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are a God who has always wanted a relationship with your people. You've wanted to be close to your people. You've wanted to meet with your people, going all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And we've seen it again tonight as we've studied the construction of this tabernacle, this tent designed to be carried through the wilderness, giving your people a place to come and meet with you. You gave plans to make that connection possible, and we're thankful for what we've learned tonight. We're thankful that this is in Scripture. And we're especially thankful tonight to be a part of your kingdom, of the church, your family. Thank you, Father, for that amazing blessing. Thank you for wanting to be with us and close to us. Thank you, Father, for loving us. Thank you for Jesus. Tonight we come to you in his name. Amen.